So I, I think for me covering the about pathophysiology of um, sensory neurohaemia is it, it's a vast subject, and I, by no means I'm an expert at, it, at this at all. And I'll cover a few bits that's uh, useful for practice, but also possibly for your exams. And uh, thank you, Simon, for actually alluding to some of the anatomy, and I won't go into too much anatomy, but I'll cover a little bit of it just to highlight some uh, important points. Um, and I will go into maybe a few common um, causes with some pathological changes uh, and uh, that's important for us to know. <clears throat> and I'll touch just briefly on sudden sensory neural hangers, particularly uh, about the reason for doing an MRI scan and also how we treat them in these days. So obviously in, in these day days, the incidence of sensory neural hearing loss is certainly rising and whether the rise is because of it's a true rise or because we're good at picking them up is a different question. Also people are living longer there's no doubt about it and as we live longer we get degenerative changes so like developing knee or hip arthritis the ear itself develops its own arthritic changes or degenerative changes. And one of the other things we forget is we are massively affected by the environment. So there's lots of environmental exposure to drugs, as well as noise on a day to day basis, which we forget. So moving on to, as Sam has already covered a lot about the cochlea, I'll just cover a little bit more, more histologic uh, cochlea anatomy. Um, essentially, as you know, we have two and a half turns in a normal adult. And then you have the membranous labyrinth, which is surrounded by perilymph with endolymph, actually within the, uh, the scalar media. The volume of fluid that you get within the cochlea is very small, and that explains why the need for carefulness in otologic surgery. Now, uh, ear, inner ear is, is one of the most uh, highly innovated organ in the body. And in fact, uh, uh, there's massive amount of neuro. Um, <clears throat> massive amount of neuro uh, input, afferent and efferent. And we have also obviously, depending on studies, there's up to 30,000 hair cells present which transduce sound uh, into uh, electrical impulses for the brain. Um, one of the important things about, about the cochlear anatomy takes a long time to understand, and I recently myself understood better by looking at this, this um, image from Silverman's book from 1970. It's essentially worth imagining the cochlea as, as an elongated, straightened out tube. Uh, and, it's, and it has um, three compartments. And you can see it's quite easy to see in this way for the oval window going to the scalar media and uh, from the base and also for the round window in the scalar tympani, both of which are filled with perilymph. And then you have the scalar media or otherwise known as the co cochlear duct, uh, which is all connected at the apex through a narrow channel called the, uh, the helicotrema. The other thing is obviously important to understand is that the whole of the cochlea is eventually connected to the CSF system in the brain uh, through, through the paralymphatic aqueduct. The, the, one of the important things to understand is that as Simon alluded before, sometimes on very high resolution MRI scan, you can see the different compartments of the cochlea. However, <clears throat> you have on histological sections, uh, you would be able to appreciate it better how things work. So if you look at this here, you've got the scalar vestibuli, and you've got the vestibular membrane 
or the rise length, which is separating the scalar media or the cochlear duct from the, the paralymphatic fluid. And as I mentioned before, this is filled with endolymph. And similarly, the scalar tympan is filled with paralymph. And if you go to the bacilla or the basement membrane, where the, the important um, sensory organs are, uh, is housed with, with the sensory hair cells. The most important ones to understand, there are lots of other supporting hair cells, but if you've got one layer of inner hair cells, and if you've got three layers of, or three, sorry, one row of inner hair cells, and you've got three rows of external or outer hair cells, and they're actually separated by a little uh, structure called the, the tunnel of corti. Essentially, it's a more of a supporting structure with some neural fiber going through it. I'll skip this slide. At the free ends of the hair cells, you have the stereocilia. And depending on, again, which studies you look at, there are numerous stereocilia on each cell. But it can be up to as high as 140. They, they're very tiny. They're only about a few micrometers long. And, and they are the, they're the main importance in terms of picking up sounds. Just briefly, and, and here I'm not trying to kind of feed everyone a lot of knowledge of, that you can actually find out from Google or any other books in the world. But basically, the cochlea is there to transduce um, sound that comes in, causes a essentially a mechanical traveling wave within the cochlear fluid, which then um, through depolarization or hyperpolarization creates an uh, electrical impulse that ends up eventually into the cerebral cortex. Uh, which then we define as sound that we understand. But one of the other key functions of the cochlea is actually trying to analyze what frequency and what intensity of sounds coming through and, and define how to protect itself or actually respond to it. Our hearing range is not massive actually compared to other animals. Uh, and, and certainly beyond 100 decibel, uh, we, we tend to become very uncomfortable with the, the sounds exposed. <clears throat> Just for reference, the internal hair cells are actually generally much strong, although it's a small amount compared to the outer hair cells, and therefore you're less likely to have damage or get to them first. And you'll see through other slides, the outer hair cells are often the prime, um, uh, the primary sites of damage when it comes to sensory hearing loss. I just wanted to just briefly cover a bit about the, the processing within the brain. Um, obviously, this pathway everyone knows where the cochlear nerve, and I'm, I'm being slightly Pedantic here that I'm using the word cochlear nerve rather than the whole vestibular cochlear nerve here. Because I just want to focus to be on hearing rather than balance here. The nerve fibers actually in the brainstem, they start to split. And then they end up on both sides of the cerebral cortex uh, or the auditory cortex located in the temporal lobe. And that's why if you've got a brain lesion, it's unlikely that it's going to end it's going to cause only unilateral hearing loss. It's more likely that it's going to be a bilateral hearing loss. The other effects that we're not, we're less aware of perhaps, or, 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 although we do it on a daily basis, our ability to block out unwanted sounds. For example, if you're in a nightclub or in a party, sometimes we can, despite lots of sounds, we can focus on an individual that we're trying to talk to. And this is uh, done primarily by the brain itself, by literally filtering out other sounds, signal and, and intensity of sounds. Similarly, automatically, there are specific neurons present in the midbrain that help us with localization of sounds. And on the same token, 
you have sounds where, where, sorry, neurons in the brain where we can detect changes in sound. So for example, if you walk into a room and you've got air conditioning on, initially you notice that it's on, but then within, within a certain amount of maybe minutes or an hour, uh, we actually get used to it. Uh, and similarly, again, when you switch it off, you first notice it, but then you get used to it. And so the whole ambience of the sound becomes part of the actual environment. And this is not because of uh, some random, there are specific neurons in the brain that are controlling such an adaptive, uh, adaptive behavior. But also there are other more complex interaction in the brain goes on in relation to sound stimuli of different kinds. For example, a baby's cry uh, will give a different response to a mother compared to somebody else who doesn't know the baby. Similarly, in battlefields, uh, sounds that are produced, on one end, it will create excitement of possible some degree of happiness, but on another end, uh, it will create frightening uh, thoughts. So these are all automatically done at the higher level in the auditory cortex. Just gradual movement of your pathological changes. Now, when it comes to sensorineural hearing loss, there are lots of reasons, lots of structural abnormalities that may be noticed. Obviously, one that most of us are familiar with, anatomic disruption i.e. lead to trauma and illness, uh, such as meningitis, uh, um, uh, but also at, at histological level, rupture of membranes. And then you have hair cell damage, which can be for lots of reasons, um, touch briefly on. But the hair cell damage can be two process. One, physical damage to a hair cell where the, the ciliary function goes away the stereocilia function goes away, or you've got specifically apoptotic process causing death of hair cells. And there's such a thing called cochlear dead regions, which is useful to understand is that this is primarily in the inner hair cells where you have areas of the inner hair cells completely necros and non-functioning. And this has implications for ability to pick up different levels of sounds. Then obviously you've got the auditory, uh, the nerve or the, the auditory tract in the brainstem. They are congenital abnormalities such as uh, either complete or partial agenesis, uh, death of neural um, uh, cells. And then neoplastic process as well, non-neoplastic such as vascular loops and inflammatory conditions. And the other thing that we may notice, and again, Simon alluded earlier a bit about, is some uh, structural anatomical maldevelopment. So dysplastic changes, such as Mundini's dysplasia uh, or Shiva's dysplasia, which is where you've got cochlear uh, dysgenesis. And finally, there are lots of reasons for damage to the auditory um, cortex, such as tumors, bleed, etc. Just briefly, when it comes to actual sensorineural hearing loss, it's, it is useful to understand that uh, it's actually in the context of three uh, major subgroup. And logically, it can be hard to add. However, if you look at sensory, loss is essentially due to the loss or abnormality of the sensory organs. And then you have the neural component, which is due to the abnormality of physically the auditory neighborhood or the auditory tracts. And if it's a massive, a pure, and if it's a, if you combine the two, essentially then you end up with problems centrally more at the, at the auditory cortex. At this stage, I just wonder if there's any questions before I go on. We'll just give, hi Mo, it's Sean, we'll just give it uh, a minute, uh, a couple of seconds, just if anyone's got any questions. No? No questions. 
no no okay. questions so far brilliant okay thank you so i'll move on to causes of hearing loss um, essentially broadly speaking you've got two groups you've got the congenital group and you've got the acquired group i think for the interest of today's talk i'm going to only talk about uh, I'm going to touch on the genetic uh, or, or the congenital causes a little bit, but I'm going to focus on a few important acquired causes. I think talking about congenital hearing loss itself is another study day. And um, uh, uh, if I go into too much detail, then, then I'm certainly going to overrun massively. Uh, when it comes to congenital, uh, you've got genetic or hereditary hearing loss that we inherit, and then you've got a group where you've got problems with development triggered by um, environmental or other factors. And then acquiring a massive list of things that can uh, cause hearing loss. But also even within acquired hearing loss, there are some genetic susceptibility. This is actually one of my patients. Uh, it's, it's a family family screening with audiology. Uh, this is a father, these are the two daughters, and this is actually the son. And just out of interest, I'll leave it to the groups to decide which syndrome or non-syndrome may be associated with this. But generally speaking, when it comes to congenital hearing loss, initially what we tend to notice is actually low to mid frequencies affected. And although traditionally, there are instances where we mentioned cookie bite hearing test appearance. I don't see that very often. Maybe I'm just not seeing enough um, congenital hearing loss. Obviously, as time goes, the hearing changes and it does eventually affect um, higher frequencies as well. So where are the problems when it goes to congenital hearing loss? Well, I think one of the problems is you have problem with homeostasis of um, different ionic components within the inner ear. Uh, and this is to do with abnormalities of the strivascularis and endolymph where either there's a problem with physically too much fluid, not enough fluid, so too much fluid, um, or simply to so do with the actual um, ionic components, i.e. potassium and calcium, um, sodium, uh, not being transported appropriately. So just to show this, again, I'm not expecting anybody to remember, but the key thing to remember is one of the biggest areas of study has been to do with potassium transport. And as a lot of you may or may not know, that connects in 26 gene mutation is probably the most uh, common non syndromic cause identified. Um, but apart from that, I won't go into massive amount about this. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a major talk. The other area you would see is obviously abnormalities, congenital abnormalities causing defects with the stereocilia. And this is. Uh, so a lot of the time more common with, with um, particularly some bio, congenital virus system to be more involved with this uh, stereocilia damage. Uh, but this is poss possibly less common out of the group of the actual mechanism that's involved. I just want to quickly show that, uh, just for your memory more than anything else, uh, it's worth knowing about this common genetic syndrome where, uh, and, and there are little hinters that quickly identifies them. Now, Osha syndrome alone, it's, there are three different types. And when it comes to genetic syndromic causes, they all have genes that are eponymous with the actual syndrome. So for example, Pendred is to do with Pendrin and so on. So, and again, these conditions and there are more than one subtypes. But it's useful to know that there are little um, clinical uh, features that will quickly point to understanding which syndrome it is. 
as all the Tustin non syndromic probably accounts for about 70% of gen uh, um, genetic congenital genetic hearing loss. And uh, the, the gap junction beta 2 protein gen genetic problems were the best to be discovered. There are six of them actually, but beta 2 is the, is the most common one. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the connecting 26 mutations that account for about more than 50% of severe profound autosomal recessive uh, sensory neural hearing loss. The rest amount for a small um, uh, percentage, about 25% of autosomal dominance. Quickly, I just want to touch on some of the acquired congenital results for sensory neural loss. Obviously, there are lots of drugs, and I think everyone knows about the, the issues of thalidomide use in the 70s and so on and so on. But also, there are lots of viruses, and in recent terms, Zika virus has been quite widely studied. And certainly, Brazilians have published with, uh, good details about its relationship to hearing, which I'll touch on briefly in a minute. Clearly, trauma to uh, physical trauma, maternal trauma, may also induce problem with the auditory uh, pathway development. And as I already mentioned, so certain dysplasias may occur with or without syndromes actually. Um, and, and not to mention torch um, associations, particularly the, the toxoplasma gondii related infection that lead to sensory neural hearing loss congenitally. I just want to quickly touch on these three viruses which have become or are relatively important for us to understand. Zika virus doesn't cause cranial you know, microcephaly, but actually uh, recent Brazilian studies showed about up to 7% of children are born with severe to profound sensory neural hearing loss. Although we don't see this in Europe much, but it is uh, an useful uh, condition to understand. Obviously, cytomegalovirus is well known, but how it causes damage is not fully clear. Um, there are some studies suggesting there's evidence of inflammation and edema uh, of the cochlea and damage to the spiral ganglion. But what's key is lots of studies have found viral antigens present in the organ of cortical, as well as the other areas of the cochlea. And similarly, rubella infection causes primarily, as a, in, when it comes to the head and neck actually, the main problem besides meningitis is actually here is sensory neural hearing loss. Um, but what's interesting, the hearing loss may not be always, um, uh, especially if it's a prenatal rubella infection, hearing loss may not be present at birth and, and you may actually even pass the neonatal hearing screening and not know that there's been a problem with the hearing. But the key way it affects is actually, it can do either direct cochlear cell damage or indirectly by actually changing the composition of the endolymph. Just wanted to show, it is worth knowing because Mondini's dysplasia is quite uh, out of the congenital abnormal, it's, it's relatively, Within that group, it's relatively common, and it's worth understanding that you get problem with the cochlea, poorly developed cochlear turns. You also get very wide vestibule, and as Simon mentioned, in sometimes it's hard to see the, the vestibular aqueduct in normal uh, normal anatomy. But in a case like this, it'd be it'd be hard to miss it. You can see it's a massive vestibular aqueduct, and here again, it's a massive vestibular aqueduct. You can see the vestibule that's, uh, it's, it's a large, wide vestibule. And this condition certainly can be, uh, as I mentioned, with syndromes, non syndromes, but also MDNA, uh, in, uh, other, other um, non syndromic causes can lead to maldevelopment. Just take a step back, uh, it's, if you understand the, the cochlea. Or, or the ear starts to develop around the fourth week of gestation from the auditory plaque. And 
the actual cochlear development doesn't complete until 23 weeks, 23 week of gestation. So there's a lot to go wrong actually. Again, any questions at this stage before I go on to the next section? Yes, yes, please, my height, Sean. Uh, this is from Tom. Um, what about HIV? It's more common than Zika. Whatever HIV is more common than No, no, what about Zika? HIV in the causation of sensorineural hearing loss? Actually, interesting mention. Although HIV is certainly common than Zika, the recent studies show that uh, the if, if a mother is actually treated by uh, for HIV and they're under treatment, then the effect on the baby is actually less. So uh, I'm not to be, I'm not exactly sure what the exact figures are, but in the past there was a high incidence of, uh, some past studies suggest a high incidence of sensorineural loss, but in recent studies, you know, the, the treated mothers with appropriate retroviral drugs, the effect is less. So can I just come in a bit like uh, Susie Dent on Countdown? I'm Googling and uh, stuff as we go along. And there's a paper which I'll put up from JAMA Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery in 2013, which shows an increased risk in sudden sensory or hearing loss uh, in patients with HIV. So I'll put the link up in the chat. Uh, so is it appears to be an increased risk with sudden loss. But uh, I'll put that link to the paper in the chat. Uh, there's no further questions, Mo, on that bit. Mo? Yeah, I'll, I'll come on to sudden sensory neural hearing loss a little bit towards the end. Because right. I just want to touch on that later. Great. So, yeah, carry on. Okay. So, <laughs> with acquired losses, as I mentioned, there's a massive range of causes. And... What one thing is that as society is, has changed, there are a lot of environmental changes that we're unaware. And in fact, two things, as I alluded before, constantly exposed in, in certainly in, in the Western world more so, uh, is the noise. You know, you go into Manchester city center, for example, you drive through this massive amount of noise, and it's the variation and the duration of the noise ha has a long-term effect. The other thing is medications. We're constantly taking different medications in, for various, even when we get called the flu, half the time we've no idea which, what's in it. But one of the common things is sinusitis that are present in a lot of say, you know, flu medications ha have an impact over a long term period. Presbycusis, clearly, this is probably the largest group in terms of acquired hearing loss. Traditionally, it's, we start off with the loss in higher frequencies, clear partly due to the anatomic factors, but partly uh, due to the, the uh, exposure to certain levels of sound. Um, more often we start, we see this in six decades of life. However, people as the youngest, 30s or 40s can be affected by this. If there is a genetic predisposition, particularly those who have some mitochondrial DNA mutations, and there are lots of them. There are several identified DNA mutations that can predispose to early presbycusis. It's a bit like, um, uh, for example, you know, Pertis disease in a child leading to early hip arthritis. Uh, you can kind of consider it in that similar context. For other factors, other illnesses such as high blood pressure. Um, increased blood viscosity, certainly alcohol abuse. And I'm using the word abuse rather than use. Use is where people are more, you know, understandably, um, you know, cautious. But where you're drinking, you know, 30, 40 units of alcohol uh, in a short period of time, these kind of things on the long term have neuronal effects. Now, uh, originally, shortness uh, classified uh, central European perspectives according to some histologic changes, and this was further modified. 
But the key thing, when you go sensorless, you go essentially degeneration of the hair cells, uh, either non-functioning or complete loss. Neuron is self-explanatory and you've got metabolic, the problem where strivascularis is affected and it's not producing the right level of the endolin or right level of the ionic components within the endolin. And the other group is or we, or where you go, it's, it's called cochlear conductive, but actually it's a mechanical problem where you've lost the supporting structure of the uh, organ of cortisol. One of the things, obviously, perspective is it's an insidious loss. And the biggest problem uh, we find is that it's sort of how someone can't hear. It's just they just don't understand what they're hearing. You know, there's clarity issue. So often, sometimes we'll hear, you know, husband comes to a clear, the wife's uh, uh, the husband will say, well, I don't have a problem, but she keeps saying, you know, uh, I'm deaf. Well, on the center group, you speak to someone uh, loudly and you think that they're not hearing, but actually they just don't understand. So they say, well, I'm, I'm not really deaf. I, I just, uh, you know, they get all upset, angry. So it's, it's worth understanding the problem isn't necessarily about not hearing, it's about uh, the ability to decipher understand what's, what's being heard. I'll move on to drugs. Clearly, there are lots of drugs. There's over 200 medications or drugs involved with hearing loss. And I think the group that we appreciate largest or understand more is the aminoglycoside group. And then you've got platinum containing uh, chemotherapy reagents. Um, but also, uh, the number of antibiotics, other antibiotics actually can cause hearing loss, but the risks are low, and often they're associated with temporary loss. The key thing to understand is platinum based chemotherapy agents and aminoglycosides, as well as industrial agents used in painting or printing industries they generally tend to cause permanent loss of hearing. So how does aminoglycosides cause? Well, actually, it's fairly straightforward. Um, they, they, they generally, like a lot of the other causes, they affect the outer hair cells first, and extremely rarely they lead to inner hair cell loss or damage. Now, when inner hair cells do get damaged, um, then you're more likely to end up with Sorry, uh, when uh, you're more likely to end up with this profound, possibly even dead ear. Now, it's important to understand that aminoglycosides are not metabolized, you know, you don't metabolize in the liver. They're pretty much actually excreted intact, and therefore it explains why their use can, in, in for example, pyelonephritis, uh, you get high dose going straight to the kidneys. But similarly, if the kidneys are not working, your risk of toxicity is very high. The other thing to understand is that there's, um, it's not, yes, there's an argument about, yes, the dose of matters. Actually, not strictly. It's about cochlear saturation. Sometimes in some people, a small dose will reach the saturation uh, potential within the cochlea, and there you, your damage will occur. And beyond that, you, think you can increase the dose. You're not gonna get any more extra damage or, or extra changes to the cochlea. So, and therefore in some, and that's where you see a lot of the time the BNF gives you a range, so three to five uh, milligram per kilogram. It, it's, it's, it's a bit of a cautious approach. But the other group, the issue is, is that the aminoglycosides, some have a more preference for the cochlea, some have more preference for the vestibule. And there are some, again, mitochondrial genetic abnormalities that actually affect the, uh, your risk of autotoxicity. But similarly, use of other drugs, such as you know, non steroidal at the same time, or loop diuretics used at the same time will certainly have a synergistic effect on, on autotoxicity. So 
want to quickly highlight essentially the antibiotics. It's worth knowing which, which are more vestibular toxic and which are more toxic. So gentamicin, for example, is generally more vestibular toxic and that explains why we use it in, um, for example, many years for vestibular ablation. So on the other hand, neomycin, which is on my list, yes, um, it's actually extremely toxic. And in fact, depending on the cause, some consider it the most toxic um, aminoglycoside or most toxic antibiotic of all. But the other important issue is other antibiotics, such as, say, for example, um, erythromycin or, or, or clytomycin, they will cause hearing loss at very high doses for a very long period. But generally, the hearing loss that occurs in, due to macrolides is actually um, re 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 reversible. Quickly, just want to touch a little bit about cytotoxic drugs. So, obviously, we, we use a lot of um, platinum based drugs in uh, treatment of head and neck cancers. However, depending on the dose, up to 50% of patients exposed may end up with a uh, sense of neural hearing loss. And I often get asked by a lot of uh, some of our oncologists to do monitoring hearing tests for them to see how they're faring and, and, and they may decide to change the drugs if the hearing loss is significant. Key thing here is cytotoxic drugs tend to cause loss of outer hair cells. Um, I have not yet come across a dead ear uh, or, or certainly you know, uh, unrecordable hearing um, due to cytotoxic agents yet, but perhaps uh, this is to do with cautious use of it. Just to hi highlight, most important of all is actually cisplatin. And therefore, I have come across where oncologists do change to carboplatin if, if they feel that the hearing loss is getting terrible uh, too early on, on, on even low dose of cisplatin. The other groups, as I mentioned, loop directives, again, it's tend to be at very high doses, and especially if there's a kidney abnormalities, if there's you no know, failure then that may increase your damage uh, or risk of toxicity. Um, interesting to note, salicylates such as aspirin actually have very low to do. It's actually protected today in the year from or, or gentamicin or toxicity. But in higher doses though, if you start using doses beyond 300 milligrams on a daily basis, then, then there is autotoxicity that may or may not be reversible. Just briefly, one of the main features of autotoxicity is osolopsia. And in fact, tinnitus may be often the first symptom rather than the later symptom. And the effect is generally is, is higher frequencies first and eventually lower frequencies. Quickly, just touch a brief. Some, I'm not sure how am I doing for time, actually. Mate, carry on. It's really good. Just you, you just keep going. Thank you. So, well, um, just for everyone, we'll have a, we'll be having a break after this. Uh, that's fine. Carry Excellent. On. Thank you. Now, as I mentioned, besides perspicuses and drugs, I think noise induced loss is probably the biggest group, and in fact, that actually influences the other two groups, presbycusis as well as autotoxicity. And if you compound with our general lifestyle these days, particularly in, in the busy cities throughout the world, um, uh, noise is a massive exposure. For example, uh, in Bangladesh, Dhaka, they, they have a capital city with about 20 million people. They have recorded massive incidents of noise in and And it's not because of a bomb blast or something like that. It's just the daily noise exposure. And generally speaking, it affects, or, or, or in an audiologic um, testing, we notice it's the four kilohertz that most commonly are noticeable. However, actually, you may see two, three, six. It's all to do with the basal turn of the cochlea being more uh, related to these, these frequencies of sounds. However, eventually, as time goes, 
the other frequency group can be affected. But important to notice that concomitantly with noise induced loss, you may get pressed by QC. So sometimes it may be difficult to tell, especially at later stages of Now, this is well documented that uh, sound intensity beyond 85 decibels uh, tend to be uh, the main reason for loss of sound. Now, this is quite easily uh, achievable. If you go to Manchester City Centre, you go behind a couple of lorries, uh, you know, it won't, be, it won't be hard to get uh, reach that kind of level of sound. Or if you are uh, even driving past Manchester Airport, even a light aircraft can actually produce sound um, intensity as far as even 110 decibels. Now, in, it's, it's mind-boggling to know that this is what we are exposed on a day-to-day basis, but obviously these are unavoidable. As I alluded before, total amount of sound exposure, even at you know, 70, 80 decibels, over a long period of time actually can lead to loss. I think most of us are aware of how sound causes damage. Obviously, for the temporary uh, uh, threshold shift, which occurs, for example, you come out of a nightclub and you hear some buzzing noise, however, a day or two later, this goes away. So that's great. Um, but then you've got permanent social shift where you've got, you've got festival damages to the uh, organ of corti, and there you've got, you've got you've developed some hearing loss. And then you've got massive acoustic trauma, such as an explosion, bomb blast. Um, uh, so, you know, and, and interestingly, obviously, this is very less, very much le less common these days. But it is something that can lead to massive or immediate, uh, massive but also immediate hearing loss. And there are occasions where uh, there are enough reports of complete or total loss of hearing from this. Risk factors, clearly there are, certain, as I mentioned, certain, even with the noise injuries, there are factors that increase your risk. So if you are someone who has a mitochondrial DNA abnormality, you, you're more likely to be affected by even low intensity sounds. Cigarette smoking, diabetes, I, as uh, these are to do with vascu vascular changes to the cochlea or, or blood supply to the cochlea. And essentially, again, similar if you've got concomitant autotoxicity, clearly you will get more loss. Now, uh, it's important to understand that there are some hypothetic um, ideas floating about noise induced loss. And as far as tem temporary threshold shifts in, in voice, easier to remember it's a metabolic abnormality that causes the problem. And thankfully, because it's a metabolic abnormality, the cochlea has the ability to recover. However, permanent threshold shift is, is a structural change. So, Going back to again embryology, the cochlea uh, is uh, fully developed when we are born. And therefore, once uh, you know, it's, it's, it's with a full complement of hair cells, full complement of neuronal uh, connections. However, in life, it does not, it, it can only degenerate, it doesn't regenerate. So well, that's an important factor to understand. And therefore, when you get a damage to a cochlear um, organ of corti, for example, it, it will, it will, when there's a permanent damage, certainly this will not um, recover. And so with permanent cirrhosis, you've got problem with the acting filaments of the stereocilia, but also the abnormality of stryovascularis is leading to problem with endolymph of fluid itself, as well as loss of supporting cells. I'll go on to a little bit about other forms of trauma. Um, head injury. Head injury causes 
here in us two, possibly in two or three different ways, uh, at least two different ways that we allow us to understand. One is uh, if you get minor head injury, uh, where you get essentially a bit of a concussion syndrome, and that can be associated with some degree of hearing loss. And a lot of the time, this tends to be temporary. A lot of people do tend to recover. On the other hand, if for the temporal bone fractures, and as we all know, clearly transverse fractures have the, the transverse fractures, those particularly going to the optic capsule, have a higher incidence of um, sensory hearing loss, including dead ear. Um, other surgical trauma, I, I, I'm not a big fan of using the word iatrogenic trauma. Iatrogenic kind of takes the blame away from us surgeons. I think there is surgical trauma and we are responsible for it. So it's important to understand that inducing surgical trauma, particularly damage to the labyrinth or causing a leak while you're handling the occipital chain can lead to sensory neural hearing loss. And as going back to my one of my earlier slides, the actual paleo volume it's only, only 0.2, maybe maximum 0.3 milliliters. So it's very easy to lose that and then end up with a hearing loss. As I mentioned about acoustic trauma, explosions particularly will lead to rupture. It will lead to rupture of the membranes involving the cochlea. So the, the important membrane to be ruptured is the, is the risinous membrane. And then you put essentially a mixture of infant lymph and perilymph mixed up together. And that is not conducive to conductive sound. The other thing we less understand possibly is barotrauma, is pressure changes. And a lot of us fly in, uh, in airplanes, etc. cetera. Um, I actually, We've got some information from, from my own grandfather many years ago that uh, during the Second World War, there was one of the problems was that there were a lot of um, Air Force pilots were going up in planes at very high speed, but then they dived straight down to the sea and either killed or whatever. And eventually, uh, in fact, the story goes, he was a fourth year medical student in those days during the war, recognized that actually there was a lot to do with the pressure in the ear. So then they routinely started doing um, uh, meningotomy in uh, some of those uh, pilots. And then they found that, yes, there was some reduction, but obviously that alone wasn't enough. There were changes to the cabin pressure, et cetera. I think barotrauma doesn't just affect the hearing. It's important to know that it does have a massive effect on more than the hearing it is actually the balance to, uh, by affecting uh, the, the vestibular system. Wait, let's, let's skip that. I want to just touch on these couple of little conditions. Um, meningitis. Uh, it's important to know that, uh, you know, as far as depending, look, look at this paper, up to 30% of meningitis patients may have not hearing loss. But the question you're going to ask is, What's the real reason for the hair? Is it actually the infection or is it the fact that the drugs being used, such as gentamicin or other um, autosox drugs that actually have an impact on the hair? So that's a debatable question. And um, uh, I think the answers we may never know in some cases, and we'll have to accept that sometimes it's the disease, uh, in some cases the disease and the drugs may have contributed. But, but the most common reason for meningitis leading to sensory neural hearing loss on pathological grounds is actually essentially leading to bacterial infective labyrinthitis, destroying the membranous labyrinth. Um, but there may well be lesions affecting the, the auditory cortex or, or, or the brainstem or the midbrain. Now, what's important, Simon alluded about, uh, is the post meningitis hearing, where you're thinking about cochlear implants. I think this has to be done fairly quickly uh, before ossification sets in, and therefore you can't actually insert a uh, electrode far enough. There are some immunological causes, and I won't dwell too much into this as it's related to the report. Important to understand many years disease. Is he actually 
an immunological function? Is it due to some inflammation going on? I think there are some evidence for that. Uh, uh, you know, inflammation increasing the endolymphatic um, um, volume and thus the pressure. But also there are such a thing called autoimmune inner disease, in, inner ear disease. Now this can be associated with lots of syndromes such as Bechet syndrome, Huber syndrome. But I actually have also uh, read up and also have a couple of patients under my own care who, who have this in association with HLA B27 atropathy. Uh, and interestingly, whenever their arthritis flares up, their hearing also goes up. So uh, high dose steroids and immunosuppressants seem to work quite well for that. The important thing to know that anti-cochlear antibody has no real connect, you know, no real prognostic indication for this. Um, and, and it doesn't always help to diagnose it either. It's more to do with doing the antibody test related to specific disorder such as Cianca, Pianca, uh, or, or that kind of stuff. So quickly touching on asymmetrical hearing loss. Um, particularly in male subjects, there is a difference between the two here, in, in, even in normal hearing. I think there's about 4% difference between left ear uh, and the right ear in men generally in a normal circumstance. And therefore, slight asymmetry in, in men may not necessarily be considered appropriate. However, a recent, uh, there's a question about whether we do an MRI scan for asymmetrical hearing as well. I'm, I'm not sure whether medically, legally, when you see a true asymmetry, you can defend yourself if you didn't do a scan. But the pickup rate is absolutely minimal. And this is uh, based on uh, one of the studies I looked recently. Well, it was uh, this, uh, this one where we uh, looked at almost 700 patients and the pickup rate was absolutely minimal. So the question is whether you do a scan straight away or six months later, probably not gonna ma make a massive difference. Um, <clears throat> a diabetes, I think I also know the evidence. Uh, is that it certainly an effect on labyrinthine microvessels that cause diabetic, um, cause hearing loss. Diabetic per se, however, is not really an attributable cause for sensory hearing loss. Well, it's more to the secondary damage to um, vascular, vascular anatomy. And there is good evidence that if you go good control diabetes, you can slow down the progression of your hearing loss. Just very quickly, I just want to touch on non-organic, um, essentially fake uh, hearing loss. These, there's no real pathology for this, apart from possibly either psychological reasons or some sort of a reason for uh, mitigation to gain some money maybe, um, or, or maybe some attention seeking. Uh, and um, uh, it's important to know that there's always inconsistencies with the hearing test, and that's often the way to point towards that. Key things to understand is that maybe a audiometry won't confirm it, but certainly stapedial reflex, presence of stapedial reflex will tell you that there is hearing, and confirmation comes from uh, auditory brainstem or cortical above to response audiometry. I appreciate that there's, there's been, uh, a lot of people know about stand justice, but personally speaking, in clinical practice, I have never done one, and I won't uh, advocate trying to spend time in clinic doing this when you've got better tests to confirm that fairly quickly. Any questions at this stage before I just briefly talk about, just briefly talk about sense of sudden loss? Okay. Um, yeah, hi, Mo. Yeah. Just, Mo, just for my information, just how much longer have you got? I know we're just running. Literally less than five minutes. Perfecto, right, I'll tell you what, so here we go. Just in terms of questions from the floor, um, from Bath, were there, with the different types of presbycusis, do they have differentiating characteristics on PTA? Correct, however, um, it can be sometimes difficult, although they have different uh, appearance on audiograms, that doesn't always actually tell you that that's definitely the case. Uh, purely because some, a lot of them can be mixed as well. So how 
you know, um, yes, definitely. And I, I had some audiograms before, but I'm afraid I took them out because I wasn't sure from my presentation, I could have shown them because I wasn't sure that I'll have enough time. Uh, but uh, there are lots of books will or show you different types of audiograms for this. But certainly, yeah, there is audiologically, you can differentiate them, but not always, not always. We, we can put that slide out via AAT, actually, um, which would be good. From Sean, um, is there any other treatments can be offered for patients undergoing chemo radiotherapy, developing hearing loss, like any protective measures, or is it more rehabilitation following ototoxicity? No, there are measures. One is actually, once you know that there is ototoxicity, one of the things sometimes um, oncologists do is they ask for pre uh, uh, pre hearing before they start the, the treatment. And if somebody already has some ongoing hearing, they may not use the cisplatin or carboplatin. And then once they know that there is a problem with hearing loss, they stop using certain drugs. Um, so medication, to be honest, there's anecdotal evidence about using some steroid, but also maybe hyperbaric oxygen, but these are all anecdotal. Once it's set in place, it's set in place. Some, however, do recover. Honestly. And then Paul has asked, um, what, what does uh, TTS and PTS stand for, the sound cutout? Oh, that's temporary threshold shifts and permanent threshold shifts. Cool. And he also said this is excellent, by the way. So cheers. Oh, okay. um, Emma, Emma says, uh, Emma Stapleton, um, okay. that she finds it useful to ask the audiologist to do a Stengers test. They can do one on their audiometer. Um, which is a, a good point. And then Mohamed Salama's indication of MRI in asymmetric central neural loss. Indication. I think, I think first you've got to have um, asymmetry along at least two, two frequencies. You can't just say there's one frequency. There's minimum two frequency asymmetry and I expect to be more than 10 decibel minimum loss. And whether you do it straight away or later is a different question. But key indication would be is that if this is a new onset asymmetry, um, then it's worth doing an MRI scan. But the other thing to remember is some people would have had an MRI scan three, four years ago. The question remains is how often do you do an MRI scan in an asymmetrical loss? You know, so, so for example, if someone had an asymmetry 10 years ago, and then they develop asymmetry later on. But the scan, the fact three scans in the 10 years, how can you do the scan? Mm. But also asymmetry developing on the background of presbycusis that are progressing. Is it really worth doing a scan? I think as a clinical judgment and an individual that an individual must do when they do see the patient. Then just a final one in this section, is there any clinical significance for Maria of differentiating the exact type of presbycusis or do we just discuss it for scientific reasons? And for the vibe. No, there's, there is clinical difference actually, because if you've got cochlear conductive loss, there's more problem with clarity, where sensory neuron uh, actually is better to aid. So, so, so pure sensory loss is better to aid because neurologically they're fully functional. So that's where the, the, the clinical uh, reason come in, and that's possibly why um, these definitions came about. Great. Thank you, Mo. And we'll come to the next questions after this last okay. bit. Okay, as I said, this is just briefly. Um, I think when I'm talking about sudden sensory neural hearing loss, I'm strictly talking more about those where we have no idea what real cause is. Uh, and, and, and by definition, you've got to have about 30 dB or more over three contiguous frequencies uh, within three days to call it a sudden sensory neural hearing loss. Important thing to realize it's, it's very crucial to identify earlier whether it's actually it's a sudden conductive loss you're dealing with or sudden sense in your hands. Now, uh, as I said, there are lots of causes and I'll cover that um, briefly. The, however, like Bell's palsy, uh, there is spontaneous recovery of this. And depending on studies, you might have up to 70, 80% people who will actually recover some of the hearing spontaneously but not 100%, and therefore, perhaps, the need to treat them. Now, this is obviously from my colleague, uh, Professor Lloyd's paper uh, several years ago, 
for the for the general practice, uh, for the British general uh, uh, general practice, uh, to highlight more to the uh, GPs in the community what potential identifiable causes for certain sensory organs, and you can see the biggest group is the infections, and possibly viral infections remain the biggest group. Um, and obviously, these are identifiable causes where some of them where you can treat, do some sort of treatment to improve the outcome. Now, the treatment remains in many ways controversial, but one key thing is important is steroid. Now, how we give steroid, whether you give systemic or intratympanic, uh, that's possibly for debate, but certainly in recent years, use of intratympanic steroid has become uh, important because outcomes are looking a lot better. And uh, although even in my own practice, not fully established, I generally tend to now offer intratympanic dexamethasone over three to four weeks uh, for this kind of patients uh, and, and weekly audiologic monitoring. I think it'd be, it'd be impractical to have audiologic monitoring every two, three days. But it's very essential, as soon as we hear of a sudden sensory organs, we need to see them. Ideally, within 24 hours, we must realize everybody has a clinic, um, apart from maybe weekends, uh, or the, the get a hearing test done, confirm a sudden loss, and start treatment. Of course, if, given the current coronavirus situation, perhaps intratympanic steroid injection might not be a practical option in a lot of centers, but it is something to bear in mind. Now, MRI scanning, that's absolutely crucial for sudden sensory hearing loss, purely because this is a case where even after recovery of the hearing, the MRI scan actually confirms there's a small intracanalicular acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma. So MRI scan is absolutely crucial. Um, uh, although some may argue, uh, for me, it's, it was interesting to you know uh, that recovery does not mean there isn't a pathology. On that note, I'm just going to finish up by leaving a couple of questions, maybe for panel discussion later, if time allows. Is, is how true these two statements are that autotoxic drugs should not be used in the presence of a uh, topically should not be used in the presence of ear operation. And similarly, is intratympanic steroid injection is the best treatment for idiopathic sensory loss or sudden sensory neurohearing loss? Uh, thank you all.